So we're turning initially to Matthew chapter 9. We're not at all going to be uh, staying there, but uh, that's where we're starting off. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 10. And before we read it, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ways in which you've already been speaking to us uh, in the worship, Lord. And thank you for the reminder, Lord, that you are great and uh, you have a great name. And Father, we pray that you would impress this upon us all the more. Um, and particularly as we come to your word now, Lord, that we will be listening to you as uh, a great teacher, Lord. Um, as a, a great father who wants to guide us. And we pray we will be uh, both hearing you and willing to, uh, to heed your guidance, Lord, we pray. Um, give us that desire as we uh, come to your word now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to read two uh, short passages from Matthew, um, just as by way of introduction this morning. Uh, Matthew 9 and verse 10 is where we're starting. Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Uh, hallelujah indeed. And if we can then flick over to Matthew 12 and verse 1. Matthew 12 and verse 1. Pharisees are at it again. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered in the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Hopefully you have noticed, you have spotted a link between these two passages. Uh, hopefully you, uh, and it's only a few words, hopefully you noticed that both times when Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees, uh, rigidly trying to stick to the law uh, without any mercy, the Lord quotes a verse from the Old Testament which says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. One time he says, go and learn what it means. Uh, and another time he says, you, basically, you should have known what this means. So that is really um, where I want to start this morning. Um, it, what really, where this message started off was, was seeing this verse in both places and struck by the fact Jesus said it twice um, to, I don't know if it was exactly the same individuals, but certainly to the same group. Um, and, you know, whenever something is said once in scripture, it's important. But when it's said twice, um, especially close together, I think that's um, particularly important. Um, and it struck me really that the Pharisees really hadn't understood something about the Lord. Um, in a sense, they knew so much of him, didn't they? Uh, they uh, did so much for the Lord on the surface. They would uh, give sacrifices. Uh, they would uh, give lots of money uh, to the poor. They would fast. They would pray in public and uh, they would teach people. Uh, and they had this um, 
in-depth knowledge of the law. You know, if you, um, if you wanted a, a textbook about the law, uh, they were your people because they knew everything there was to know about what should be done and what shouldn't be done. And yet, they didn't really understand the Lord because the Lord at his heart, um, one of his main characteristics is mercy. They knew lots about the Lord, but they didn't know him. And that's what I want to fo focus on this morning. This idea of knowing about the Lord or knowing the Lord. And so I'd like to uh, turn back to Hosea, which is where that verse comes from. We're going to look at various passages this morning. We're going to go to Hosea. Nice easy one for you. All in good time. <laughs> Letting people find Hosea first of all. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. This is the verse that Jesus quoted from. Hosea 6 and verse 6 which says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now the first part, of course, is important. That's the bit which the Lord quoted, um, saying, well, sacrifice, yes, you were commanded to sacrifice. But what I really want as your maker is for you to be merciful the way I was merciful. But it was the second part that really, that really spoke to me. The, the, the part that says the knowledge of God is more important than burnt offerings. Which can strike us as a bit unusual, as we might consider later with our thinking, because you would have thought doing is more important than understanding, wouldn't you? You'd have thought doing things for the Lord <coughs> is far better than just knowing things about him. And of course, we need to do things uh, for the Lord. Uh, that should flow naturally. Um, but the Lord is saying, what I want most of all is for you to really understand me. And uh, that's perhaps where the Pharisees and where all of us uh, can fall down. Because we don't fully know the Lord and we go about trying to do things from our own understanding. But you know, earlier in that chapter, uh, Hosea 6 and verse 1, it says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. You know, it says to pursue the knowledge of God, which I think is a great aim for our lives. Um, a, a great thing that we could have maybe on the wall um, or wherever we work to have in front of us that reminder that we need to pursue not purely actions, but the knowledge of who God is. And there's another passage that takes this further, which is Jeremiah chapter 9. I'll get the chapter in quickly before Linda asks. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. It's saying, don't be proud of all you are able to do, uh, all that you um, know, humanly speaking, all the things you have. Um, he's saying glory in the fact that you know the Lord. And of course, we know the Bible has a lot to say about pride. And everything it has to say about um, pride is that it's a bad thing. 
So I don't think it's saying that we should be proud that we know, you know, we shouldn't be thinking, oh, well, I know so much more than so and so about the Lord. So I'm really good. Uh, I don't think it's saying that. Um, I think it's saying that we should be our measure of our success as a believer should be how much we know the Lord, that that should be, if you like, the benchmark that we are constantly thinking about, not how much have I done? But how much do I know the Lord? How much do I know uh, of him? How much do how close am I to the Lord? Um, that that should be the way in which we measure our lives. And the Lord says, basically, if you really know me, you will understand that I um, love loving kindness. Or we could say mercy in another sense. Judgment and righteousness. The three keys to the Lord's character. And of course, there's loads more to the Lord's character. But if you had to pick three, those are a really good three to pick, aren't they? To describe the Lord. They're the ones the Lord has said about himself. That this is what he is like. He is loving. He is just. And he is righteous. Imagine if we fully grasped what that means. Um, I say that because I don't think any of us fully do. I don't think any of us fully can understand everything of the Lord, certainly this side of eternity. But imagine if we did fully understand everything about God's love and God's justice and God's righteousness. We would fully trust him, wouldn't we? Because we'd fully know that he, how merciful he is. We would trust him with absolutely everything, without any hesitation. We'd fear him as we ought to. We would have complete and total awe and respect for him because we'd recognise just how perfect he is, just how righteous he is. And we'd want to be like him in every way because we'd understand what true righteousness really is in every way. It would make such a difference to our lives, wouldn't it, if we perfectly understood the Lord? Well, I think the more we know the Lord, the more we come to, to understand him and to be in relationship with him, the more those things can be true, can't they? In theory, the more that we get to know the Lord's love, the more we'll trust him. It's like a child with their, uh, their parents. As they grow up, they have more and more experiences, hopefully, of their parents being really merciful to them and really caring for them and helping them. So that by the time they're in their teens, they know if they have a problem, they can go straight to their parents because they've experienced, they've learnt that their parents are merciful and loving and kind and hopefully wise, um, at least hopefully. Um, so the more we know the Lord, um, the more we should change. Um, uh, that is the point. The Pharisees gloried in their so-called understanding of the Lord, their, their understanding of the law, um, but they hadn't really grasped who the Lord really was and that he wanted mercy from them. This knowledge is clearly more um, than just gain from just hearing about the Lord or, or reading about him. Um, it, uh, after all, the Pharisees knew lots about the Lord. They had the Old Testament. Uh, they had um, so many things they could look at. They knew his laws in absolute detail. And of course, his laws reflect his character, don't they? So in a sense, they had all they needed, didn't they? Um, but they missed it. I'm going to take a slightly trivial example. Um, I was searching for an example of how to illustrate this, and Dye's Cakes came to mind, as, as they do in most examples, generally. Um, they're often on my mind, I must admit. If I wrote a book, if I wrote a book about myself, uh, which I, I don't plan to do in any way, um, but if I wrote a book about, uh, about who I was, and in the book I said, I really like Dye's Cakes. Well, anybody who reads that book can be fairly confident that if they give me some of Dye's Cakes, I will be very pleased and I'll give them a free copy of the book. Yeah, they, will be, they can be fairly confident about that because they've read that. Yeah? Um, but I, if, they, if they want to give me someone else's cake, they don't know if that will be acceptable um, because I haven't written a list of all my approved cake bakers. Uh, I'm sorry this is very trivial, but this is what came to mind. Uh, unless I write a list of every single person who I would uh, accept a cake from, um, they don't know, do they? They only know that I like dice cakes. 
But if they really know me, if they really know me, they'll know I'll accept a cake from anybody, um, <laughs> made by anybody, from anywhere, if they really know me, uh, except carrot cake. Um, I would point out. Uh, I think it's something, something in the name, carrot cake. It just, yeah, yeah. Those two shouldn't go together. But there we go. Anyway, it's a trivial example, but it illustrates a point that we can read different things about the Lord. And we can say, well, we know for certain that the Lord really cares about the Sabbath and, and about us having some kind of rest. We know that. But it takes a relationship with the Lord to really understand why and to really experience the love behind his wanting us to have a Sabbath. And so it's not enough just to have a bit of a head knowledge about the Lord. That's not true knowledge. This is something deeper. We're not going to get it just by reading. Because, again, if we take that verse that the Lord quoted to them, um, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Well, that's Fairly simple to understand, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's on the face of it, it's, it's dead easy, isn't it? OK, the Lord is more interested in us being merciful than us making sacrifices. The Pharisees would have known that verse in some way, but it hadn't changed their lives. They hadn't grasped the, the, the deep meaning behind it. And so we are not just going to get it just by flicking quickly through the word, reading something and going, OK, that's what the Lord's like. There's more to discover, isn't there? Um, and I'm always touched when uh, Ray uh, shares about how after, uh, after, after a long time of um, preaching and being in the word, uh, after many years of doing that, that he's still, the Lord is still uh, opening his eyes to new treasures. Yeah. Um, and if that's the case, then certainly flicking briefly through the word is not going to give us all we need to know about the Lord. There's clearly a deeper knowledge, a deeper understanding, uh, which we're called to pursue. You know, it's possible to come to church for years and years and years and to listen to the word and listen to the, the, the Bible being read and to sing, um, perhaps even to pray um, and not really ever to come to understand who the Lord really is. And we should be careful of that. Um, that it's not about how many years we've been coming or how many years we've been reading the Bible or how many years we've been a Christian. Uh, it's all about how much have we desired to know the Lord? How much have we pushed on? Because we can easily go for decades without really getting close to the Lord because our flesh is lazy, isn't it? And naturally, unless we push ourselves to go on and pursue that knowledge, um, we can just go on for year after year after year, never really getting to know more of the Lord. Uh, but I don't, I don't know about you, I want to be uh, somebody who pushes on. Um, two uh, verses in 1 Samuel spoke to me on this. They're really short, so in a, in a way you don't really particularly need to turn to them. But I'll just read them to you. Uh, 1 Samuel 2 and verse 12 says, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. Yeah. Eli was the high priest. The Eli's sons were responsible for much of the work uh, uh, in the tabernacle. And they were surrounded by things to do with the Lord. And they would wear holy things. They would go into holy places uh, in different ways. Excuse me. They were surrounded by people who were coming devoted to the Lord, who wanted to bring sacrifices. And they were busy about the Lord's work. And yet they didn't know the Lord. And I think that's quite telling. Um, they didn't really know the Lord, so they were corrupt. And even though they were doing things for the Lord, they were doing things in the wrong way. And the other verse is 1 Samuel 3 and verse 7. <clears throat> now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And that verse is said just before the Lord first appears to him uh, uh, or, or speaks uh, audibly to him. Uh, you remember the story, one night he's lying down and he hears this voice and the Lord is speaking to him. And up until that point, it says Samuel didn't yet know the Lord. And yet this was a boy who spent his life in the tabernacle. Um, and judging by what we see from him from then on, I don't, don't think he was like the sons of Eli. He was clearly um, a boy who had a good heart uh, in many ways. And yet it said he didn't yet know the Lord. 
So there's clearly something deeper than just being in church, being surrounded by people who know the Lord. It's clearly something more than that. We need to press on. That verse uh, we read earlier about uh, glorying in how much we know the Lord. Um, it's a hard one to accept, isn't it, as we said before, because in our human minds and our human wisdom and in our culture, um, we are constantly being told it's all about how much you do. Um, it's all about uh, are, are you achieving things? Are you making a name for yourself? Um, are you doing things for other people? Um, are you getting lots and lots of knowledge and studying and, and getting qualifications and, and building up money and all of these things that we're told we should be doing? The world's thinking says you're successful if you have a lot or you do a lot or you give a lot. So when we're told that the way to please God is primarily to get to know him, it can be a bit strange, can't it? Because we want to be out there doing things. I was a bit uh, convicted about this um, because uh, it was recently my half term. Uh, as many of you know, I work in a school uh, part time. And um, I went through my usual routine during the half term of coming up with a big list uh, of things I needed to do. And going through the week, trying to do them, uh, worry creeping in at times about will I get them all finished. And then at the end of the holiday, um, I shouldn't call it a holiday, that's not really true. At the end of the half term, I look back on the week, as, as I always do, it's a pattern, and I judge how successful my half term was by how much I'd got done from my to-do list. I know. Tut away. It's absolutely true. I shouldn't be like that. But that's what many of us can do. Whether we really realise it or not. We judge how successful our day has been. Or our week has been. Or our past year has been. Um, by how much we've done. Of our list. You may not have a physical list. Um, but you will certainly have those lists in your mind. Of, of things you want to do. Or things you want to achieve. Um, things you want to say. Or, or whatever. Um, but certainly this half term, I was particularly convicted uh, to think that actually what the measuring stick of success for my half term should be, how close have I drawn to the Lord in this half term? How many of the opportunities to meet with the Lord have I actually taken up? I think that's a much better measuring stick for us to have. And so I thought I'd, I'd share that with you, that um, you can think back to your week and measure your week on that. How much time have you uh, given to, to coming to know the Lord more? I often identify with the story of Mary and Martha. Um, I, I always seem to return to that whenever I come across these things. The mind comes back to Mary and Martha because, of course, <clears throat> Martha was busy uh, in the kitchen uh, and doing something which uh, seems so important because she had guests and one of them was the Lord Jesus. I mean... You know, you would say, well, surely it's really important to be serving them. And Mary was sitting, apparently doing nothing, uh, just sitting, listening. Um, uh, though I'd give a lot for students who were like that, I must admit. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Mary was there. She was just listening. Martha comes in and says, Mary's not doing anything. Tell her to help me. And the Lord says to Martha, one thing is needed. One thing is necessary, shall we say. One thing is important, and Mary has chosen that which will not be taken away from her. So Jesus is saying, no matter how important you think anything is, what's needed, what's most important, is listening to me and learning from me. And it's more important than, uh, than rules as well, if I can put it this way. If you turn to, to 1 John and chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Whether we realise it or not, we can be like the Pharisees in many ways at times. And uh, one of the ways can be that we focus on um, keeping to a list of rules. And of course the Lord gives us uh, some rules which it's important that we stick to. But in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3, it says... Now by this, we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth 
is not in him. It's not saying that we shouldn't keep the Lord's commandments at all. We need to keep the commandments the Lord gives us. But it's saying that we keep his commandments because we know him. That's the way it should be. Not that we see a list of commandments and keep it because we think, right, well, we need to do that because we've been told to. It's because we see the list and think, my heavenly father, my Lord, who I am really close to, has said these are the things he wants. And so I want to do them because I want to please him. And because I know and trust that he has given us what is right to keep to. Our faith is not primarily about keeping a set of rules. It's primarily about knowing the Lord. And from that should come uh, the things we do. As we've said a number of times uh, recently, people have said about uh, grace and works and uh, faith, faith and works. From our faith should come works. But it's the faith that is primarily important. Because without it, those works will be empty and will be dead. You remember the passage in Galatians where Paul talks about um, being enslaved to works. And he says, um, stand fast in the liberty which Christ has uh, set us free. And do not any longer be under a yoke of bondage. And we mustn't be under that. It shouldn't be a burden to keep the Lord and uh, Lord's will. And I know it's easy to say. But it should flow from a desire to please him. And that flows from knowing who he is. And so you see, knowing the Lord is really the first step. Uh, And so if you're sat here at the moment and you are thinking, you know, I I really don't know how to get started or, or how to move on in my walk with the Lord. Well, the answer is to get to know the Lord more. Psalm 34 and verse 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. That's David writing. And you know, it's not enough for David to tell us about how good the Lord is. And of course, he does that throughout the Psalms. He says so many things about how amazing the Lord is. But he says, no, you need to taste for yourself how good the Lord is. I've tasted it. You need to taste it, is what David is saying. In the recent identity course, that, um, the, the, the meal that we had recently, um, the person talking spoke about lifeboats. And uh, I think Ray mentioned it last week as well. Um, this idea that you can look at a lifeboat. You can know everything there is uh, about lifeboats. And I particularly liked, he said, you could uh, subscribe to Lifeboat Monthly, um, uh, that well-known magazine. Um, But unless you actively get in, that lifeboat is useless to you. You've actually got to get in. You've actually got to be active and experience it. We're called to taste and see. Don't listen to just what others say. Taste and see for yourselves. And of course we uh, can taste in in, uh, various ways. We can taste by actively trusting in him. And seeing how he works for us in situations. We can taste by spending time with him. And listening to him. But we've got to be active about it. And, um, and put that time aside. I think part of my problem has often been not making enough time to taste fully uh, what the Lord has for me. Uh, I make time for the morsels. But not for the feasts. If that makes sense. Um, because we can uh, spend a bit of time in the word and receive a certain amount. But if we spend longer, the Lord can give us more. Um, and I, I certainly want to be one who desires a feast from the Lord. And uh, I think the Lord is willing to give that to us uh, many times if we'll just um, be willing to, to, to listen to him for long enough. Uh, Psalm 36, you might want to turn to. Psalm 36 and verse 7, which is where um, we get the song, How Precious, O Lord, is Your Unfailing Love. Uh, We get that from this passage. Psalm 36 and verse 7. Psalm 36. That's fine, no problem. Psalm 36 (coughs) and verse 7. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men 
put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. I don't know if you've ever read that verse and felt a bit like it doesn't have much meaning for you. Um, I know I have <coughs> at times to have read that and thought, yeah, you know, it talks about the Lord giving drinks from the river of your pleasures, but um, I haven't really fully experienced that. But it's in the word. And it's in the word and therefore it is true. And we know that um, everything that the Lord says in his word um, is fully accurate. And so it is obviously possible to be able to drink continually from the river of the Lord's pleasures. And of course I don't think it's to talk about pleasures as in um, cars and money and fame and all of these things. I mean it's the pleasure of knowing the Lord and the pleasure of uh, being led by him and him providing for us in every single way that we need uh, for life. We can be abundantly satisfied with the fullness of the Lord's house. Or we can be partly satisfied with a small part of the Lord's outbuilding. There's another way we could say that, isn't it? But we need to be abundantly satisfied with the fullness of the Lord's house. And we mustn't let that laziness creep in that settles for less than the fullness that the Lord wants to give us. We had the parable of the sower, um, which you will know, um, or uh, in, in a Bible I, I uh, looked at uh, with this, it said uh, the parable of the soils, which I thought was a, an interesting way to put it, because of course it is about different types of soil. And in the parable of the, the soils, shall we say, uh, the thorns, when the so- seed fell on the thorns, uh, choked up the seed. It was the cares of, the li- of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. We need to make sure that those things, as we talked about our job lists earlier, that those things don't choke um, our time uh, in hearing from the Lord and receiving the fullness of him. Well, I hope that through all of this, that it's encouraged us to press on and pursue that knowledge of the Lord. And so I just want to finish with a couple of encouragements um, about this. And the first of those two is in Exodus and chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. And verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I am, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, The land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. What really encouraged me about this uh, passage as I read it recently was thinking that, you know, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they experienced something of the Lord. And they knew him uh, in one way and they knew his uh, his name here as God Almighty and they, they experienced that. And the Lord says here to Moses, now I'm going to reveal myself even more to the Israelites. Um, And then to think that the Pharisees, who we talked about uh, uh, earlier, they had even more because they had the Old Old Testament, um, uh, I think in its entirety, uh, at least most of it, they had the Old Testament there. So they had all that the Lord said to all of those people. And now to think that we have the New Testament as well. We have the whole Bible full of revelations of who the Lord is. Well, that should be an encouragement to us that we're not going to run out of things to look through um, before we die or before the Lord returns. That there is so much out there and the Lord has given us so much to teach us from. We just have to get started, don't we? And the second one is from 1 Corinthians. uh, And uh, you don't need to turn to it uh, unless you want to. We have read it uh, recently, but it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When we were talking about uh, the Holy Spirit and his work in uh, revealing things to us. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. That's encouraging in itself, isn't it? That the Lord has these things which are beyond our imagination, as I think we said when we spoke about this. Those things that are beyond our imagination which the Lord is willing to reveal through his Spirit. And it goes on and says, For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God, except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Remember, we, I used the illustration uh, of Josie. Oh, sorry, I'm going to use it again. The illustration uh, that I can come to know so much about Josie uh, as my wife. Uh, and yet, unless I have her spirit within me, I can't know every single little thing about the way she thinks and feels uh, and experiences things. And yet, the Lord has made his spirit available to us, to be in us. We have every thing that we need we have the whole of the bible we have the lord's own spirit we have the lord jesus words and experiences in the bible where he says that through him you can come to know the father so we have everything we need let's be those who pursue the knowledge of god you know i think the lord would want to say to us this morning come and taste my goodness let go of the things that you're striving for Lay aside those sins and distractions that keep you from coming to me. Forget what has happened before. All of those quiet times that, that maybe you've not spent that time that you needed to. And press on to know me. Taste and see that I am good. Feed on that finest of the wheat. And I will give you treasure that you can pass on to others. You know, there's a, a verse that talks about uh, a good man from the good treasures of his heart brings out good things. Mm -hmm. If we come to really deeply know the Lord, we can bring out those treasures to others Amen. that we have learned from the Lord. And we can bring glory to his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you want to reveal yourself to us at all, Lord. We thank you, Lord, we can know your name, Lord. We can know your goodness to us and your mercy, Lord. We can know your guidance, your correction, Lord. We can know so much of you, Lord. And we're sorry, Lord, where we don't desire it enough, Lord. Um, but we thank you, Lord, that all of us here, uh, from the youngest to the oldest, Lord, from the most experienced Christian to the least, Lord. Uh, from even those who don't know you. Lord, that we can all come to know more of you. And so we pray, Lord, that you would reveal more to us. And that you would work in us to help us to desire that, Lord. Uh, Lord, show us practically, Lord, where we can be uh, setting aside more time. Or uh, how we can be getting into your word more. Or, or just how we can be sitting and, and, and listening to you, Lord, as we come to pray. We just pray for your help, Lord, that uh, we might really pursue the knowledge of you in every way, Lord. That we might bring out that treasure for others, Lord, and glor glorify your name, we pray. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.